in the deepest darkness blooms the brightest hope. Trinidad and Tobago, a multiracial nation that celebrates all her children. Trinidad and Tobago, you know, is a, a melting pot of so many different races. There is no mother India for us. There is no mother Africa. There's no mother China, no mother Europe. But we do have grandmother India and grandmother Africa. We do celebrate each other's cultures. Sun soap surf, cloud crown skies, and the island life. Trinidad and Tobago, where the colors of the rainbow paint the land and her people. Mercedes outside a roti shop. Music to make you raise your hand. And woman to make a man of man. When I wake up first thing in the morning, and the bulk are crowing, sweet Caribbean. Evening breezes blowing through the window, tickling the big toe, sweet Caribbean. Sandwiched between North and South America, the Caribbean islands of Trinidad and Tobago are a serene bridge where nature and humanity pause between the hemispheres. And having paused, many stay on, finding a home beneath the palm fronds, holding up the heavens. Trinidad was one of the earliest societies that would have so many different groups. My father is from Jaipur. My forefathers came from Lebanon. And I'm of Africa. There's a lot of different mixture of cultures coming here. We have the Dutch culture from Suriname. We have Brazil, so we have Guyana, so then we have Bollywood, China, and of course Europe. When you walk the streets of Trinidad, you see for yourself the multiculturalism by looking at the faces of everyone. You know, as much as we're East Indians, as much as we're Africans, Chinese, Syrian, whites, we're Trinis, as they say. Mistaken for India by Columbus in his attempt to discover a new sea route, Trinidad and Tobago, along with the rest of the Caribbean, were referred to as the West Indies. But even before Columbus, chance, choice, and compulsion all had a role to play in peopling this twin island nation. When the Europeans came, there was a very active, proactive indigenous community. This indigenous Native American culture was soon swamped by the next wave of immigrants. Europeans who were quick to recognize the island's inherent bounty. Warm climes and rich soils meant that they were earmarked for a quick conversion from tropical paradise to plantation economy. Africans were born in Trinidad, um, uh, crossing the, as you all said, the Kalipani. And as Europeans turned to planting sugar, they bought Africans as cheap labor. When you don't have to pay for labor, you get more profits. Kidnapped African slaves cleared dense forests and planted vast sugarcane fields under the most horrific conditions. But this was a state of affairs that could not be permitted to continue. Conscience rebelled and eventually the slave masters themselves abolished slavery. 
When slavery was abolished in the Caribbean, there was need for laborers to work in the sugarcane fields. Because the freed blacks did not want to work again, they associated sugarcane labor with slavery. They then tried the Chinese labor, which did not work all that well, and then what we saw was the bringing in of indentured laborers. Desperate conditions in India, endemic famine and drought, meant that for many, crossing the Kalapani was the only hope of survival. They did not come to the Caribbean willingly or happily, because now they had to abandon their dhirti mata, the gai mata. So the movement outside of Bharat was not a willing movement, was not voluntary. They were forced to, to leave without because the, the life in India was, was one of total deprivation, hardship, famines. A largely landbound people were forced to face the onslaught of the sea, the dreaded Kalapani, to reach the very edge of the known world. A three to five month journey that for too many ended in death. My grandmother came from India, Patna. My mother was born on the boat the SS Matla, but my grandfather had died and apparently they threw him overboard. So my grandmother knew nothing until she landed in Trinidad. Bereft and alone in a new land, it was another indentured laborer who came to their rescue. This guy, Gedari, he met my grandmother and he offered to take her. So he took her and he married her and they had a son. So I don't know my father, dead, dead and gone, but no dead father who take me. I know him, my me. He had a son in um, India in um, Samir. When time to marry, money was too less. Then we stand by his son and get from India money. Then I married in Trinidad. Despite never knowing a father, Despite knowing no life but the punishing struggle for existence common to all indentured laborers, Samundari is one of the lucky ones. She survived and built a family of children and grandchildren, of love and now laughter. Trinidad today is full of Samundari's descendants, the children of indentured laborers who along with the children of slaves and slave masters have built a true rainbow nation where ethnicity and ancestry is increasingly shared. One of the clearest demographic trends of the last 20, 30 years has been intermarriage between young people of the African and Indian communities. Our mixed population is almost like about 20%. It's only natural that Africans and Indians would fall in love and they produce what we call in Trinidad, Douglas. About 42% of Indian origin, Trinidad's ethnic mix also comprises a significant Afro-Trinidadian and mixed population, with a smattering of Europeans, Chinese and Middle Eastern people, all mingling and mixing right across racial and religious lines. My great-grandfather is Madras Indian, and he's from Guyana. I see, you're gonna think that, eh? My mom's name is Neela. And which of course means blue. I'm, I'm mixed with Chinese, Portuguese, and African. My great great grandfather is a recent descent. My children is mixed Spanish, Indian, and Negro. I'm Negro, Spanish, um, Douglarized. Indeed, in Trinidad's bold new post racial world, being mixed is a distinct advantage. They have the best opportunity to show us how to really live. While being mixed race helps in seeing multiple points of view, it's not a requirement for empathizing with each other's history. One writer, Dr. Eric Williams, one of our past prime ministers, would you believe he said that, that, that Indian immigration was worse than slavery? Indentureship's terms meant that many plantation owners viewed laborers dying before the end of their contract as more profitable than paying for their return to India. Yet. Despite the horrific conditions, indentureship did offer the prospect of freedom that slavery simply denied. To the slaves, that's a brutal period in our history that should never be repeated. Nelson Island, which guards the entrance to Trinidad and Tobago's capital, Port of Spain. Here, 
laborers were quarantined for days before being swallowed up by the vast sugar plantations. Nelson Island is, has really great historical significance to Trinidad and Tobago. The oldest building in Trinidad was constructed in 1802 by enslaved Africans. From 1865, Nelson Island served as the depot for indentured laborers who came from India. Today, Nelson Island lies silent. Its dread depots, roosting spots for vultures. Where once echoed the grief of thousands, today, silence screams. I think in any society we look at, we'll see that there, there would be painful moments. We are trying to, to restore Nelson Island, to make it back into a museum of the peoples. A similar memorial is also planned at yet another testament to the days of slavery and indenture. Witness to man's depravity against his fellow men. These fields, plowed in pain, tilled with tears, drenched in blood, are both reminder and rebuttal to a nation so deeply scarred by its history. We have to pay homage for those people who stood up against those hard times, the difficult times, to face all the humiliation and separation, and they stood against that to form what it is today, to own their rights, to own their religion, to own their culture. A common remembrance of a shared struggle and a joint triumph, this memorial is a tribute to Trinidadians who've overcome their past, moved beyond the hurts of slavery and indenture. This is the message that, I'm, that I think we're trying to pitch to the rest of the world of how to manage diversity. But when you take a long-term view of how cultures evolve, people work these things out. With time, um, the generations have learned to accept and they have learned to evolve and learned to embrace um, one another. Indians came here and stood their ground and are now respected and appreciated in this country. Modern, multicultural and truly inclusive. A land where race does not define culture, where the other is your own. And so the strains of classical music echoing out of a classroom pulls in all aficionados. <laughs> dancing Bollywood style dan of dancers for about, well, 18 years. For about last two years, I did classical Indian dance, kata. I started dancing the style of folk first, and then we started with the modern, and then we came to do classical Indian dance. I've been dancing from the age of seven, maybe about 15 or 16 years ago. For these students of the University of the West Indies, learning Hindi, studying music, is just a prelude to being immersed in the rhythms of Indian dance. I like the intricacy of the hand movement. The costume especially and the makeup, I think all those things going together just creates a very good image and is very attractive. You have rigid movements, but all the movements and I tell a story. I like anything to do with um, Lord Shiva because, you know, he's a lot of that. Classical, very kind of rigid, where the Bollywood is a lot of waste. Things that we know already in Trinidad. Until quite recently, it would have been very rare for an Afro-Trinidadian to be interested in aspects of Indian culture. I do think that's changing, though. This integration is seen everywhere in Trinidad and Tobago. I think increasingly there's a move to greater appreciation of each other's cultures. When you live as close as we do in small villages and you understand how easy it is for friendships, for fellowship, how easy it is to keep connected. I see you with two hands, I have two hands. You have two feet, I have two feet. What makes us different? And we cut our veins, it's blood. We are all of this world. It's not about Indians, it's not about Africans, it's about Trinidadians. St. James, 
the city that never sleeps, where local Trinis come to lime and feast. Port of Spain's original Cooley town, St. James was once segregated into Indian and African enclaves, which have over the years merged to create mixes that are the epitome of Caribbean cool. Here you will find everything that I've been saying about multiculturalism and diversity. The people, the cuisine, the music, it's all represented here. You will see here Ali's roti shop from our Indian heritage, the Chinese restaurant there, jerk chicken, part of the Caribbean cuisine heritage. For a culture that's all about keeping cool, Caribbeans take their food very seriously. Saturday morning is market morning at Trinidad's Tuna Puna Bazaar, where Trinis shop for the freshest ingredients to make a dish that represents Trinidad and them. Trinidad is often uh, described as being a Kalaloo, a place like a Kalaloo, meaning that it's got so many different cultures that are mixed together as one particular dish. Just the way we live and we live together, uh, that, that will allow us such, what we call Kalaloo here, it's a super, you mix lots of stuff together, such Kalaloos. And to get a taste of this yummy soup, we visit short celeb chef Khalid Muhammad. I, I would say that Indian cuisine has influenced other cuisines. You will see curries and spices and herbs being used in in the other cuisines. This infusion of spice has given TNT's East Indian food a sumptuousness that no true Trini can resist. I try to uh, make a nice food, but we cannot beat up with the Trinidadian food, you know? Roti and all this stuff, you know? We like Indian people, we love Indian people. You go anywhere where they sell the ever famous doubles or bar, as they call it, and you see mainly Afro Trinidadians eating bar. The curry dishes that they have introduced is now a, a huge part of our food. There's a simple thing that we eat and most of us have it on morning, it's doubles, which is the chickpeas on the inside, it's curry. And that's a very popular morning breakfast dish that was, you know, that is now here from the East Indians. You'll be surprised to see the long lines waiting to get their Indian roti and their Indian curry and their Indian curry mango and their Indian curry duck and most people in the line are Africans and Chinese and Syrians and Portuguese because the Indians are already home making their own roti. Canny Indian entrepreneurs have capitalized on Islanders' love for roti, doubles and all things curry to create fast food empires displaying a knack for business that's taken Trinis Indians to the top. Well, I think the East Indians have been able to build a foundation for the economy. Uh, in the first instance, it was largely in the area of agriculture. Uh, subsequently, it reflected itself in the field of the professions. And at the same time, it began to be very much involved in the commerce of the country. There's also a tremendous sense of uh, a thirst for education and for knowledge, and also a tremendous sense of entrepreneurship. So there are many, many businesses that are run by persons of Indian origin. The, the contribution of the East Indian to business development in Trinidad and Tobago has been extremely significant. They chose the opportunity of owning their own business and the opportunity to generate um, employment as a, as a preference over things like going into the public service. Starting with trade and advancing to manufacturing, the story of East Indian Trinis who stormed the world of industry and finance is exemplified by Helen. My father used to work in the sugar estates, cotton cane. Then he left the sugar estate and he started a little bicycle shop. From the bicycle shop, we went into selling furniture. From furniture, we went into hardware. And at age 11, they took me out of school to help in the store. 
and I got the feeling of hardware business from then. And I think all the values that my father instilled in me, about working hard, being honest, dealing with people fairly, that pay played a long role in my life. Celebrating her seventh decade, Helen shows no sign of slowing down. Diversifying into building block industries like steel manufacturing, Trini's East Indian community has grown in leaps and bounds commercially and professionally, thanks to a work ethic that settles for nothing less than the very best. What's amazing is that where how they started up, you know, they started from next to nothing and, you know, to the extent where they can compete on the global market and I think that's remarkable. I think the East Indian community has d contributed quite a lot to the economy. They have a great influence in, the, in manufacturing, they have good influence in the distributive trades and construction. Um, in, in every aspect of, of economic activity, they, they contribute and they, they are very good in terms of corporate social responsibility also. Spearheading giving back to Trinidad is Disha Murjani, who's mined her Indian heritage to create Bombay Dreams. Bombay Dreams is an idea I had about fusion, and that's what Trinidad is about. Trinidad is about appreciating everybody's culture, enjoying it, and being a part of it. Monies uh, are, are given to those who really are in need for children to save their lives. An extravagance of music and fashion, Bombay Dreams brings together Trinidad's top designers and musicians, united in the efforts to help children. It was spectacular. I think it came out really well. It was very rich and inviting and it really be, gave you a sense that you were in India when you walked into the event. Combining fun and philanthropy with typical Indian pizzazz, Bombay Dreams is a runaway success, as is a more under-the-radar effort to encourage Trinidad's children. I would normally take for about uh, all my, my entire school life. I try my best to come down to visit my family maybe once a week or if there's like a family gathering or something like that I'm down in Barapo or an event. Um, you know like today we've got uh, a guidance day with the kids in my uh, scholarship program. Our focus is selecting the kids who come from less fortunate backgrounds, who has got an above average uh, extracurricular talent, who is willing to balance that talent with their academics as well. We're trying to give that child the best opportunity of developing. This program, benefiting so many young kids, run by one of Trinidad's most beloved sons, former cricket captain Darren Ganga, is his effort to repay some of the incredible love and support his nation has given him, a love that's still going strong. No, but I do, I do wrong number, I know. Yeah, fam. He's always there at all the cricket matches. I don't make smart in Trinidad. When you make it double 100 against Australia, drinks start to come like that. <laughs> As you make it 100, that is history. Put it down in the records. <laughs> Chronicling the Indian community and showcasing it to the Caribbean is Mohan Jaikaran and his entertainment conglomerate, Win TV. We 
create a lot of local programming as you can see and also a lot from India because Bollywood is huge here. It's huge. I mean, Shah Rukh Khan is a big star here. You know, and it's, it's you know, people love the movies. And the Indian market, in, I mean, is really where the money is in this, in this country. Mohan's creative teams come together to create polished news, business and cultural shows that are widely watched. And we get a chance to peek at Sheldon Yearwood, Will TV's premier anchor, getting ready for his evening broadcast. I am what you would consider Afro-Trinidad. I work at a station where predominantly East Indian, and I'm speaking here as God as my witness. It is one of the more comfortable environments I've ever worked in, as far as I can say, it's family. And when TV has never once showed me any sort of disrespect or slight me because of my complexion. I'm one of the main anchors on the station. This comfortable collaboration between black and brown has its roots in a shared history, a common struggle. We have so much races here, but only two races, only two, went through the most struggle, East Indians and Africans. So that whole aspect of struggling to survive, we can identify with. Transforming Trinidadians' inherent unity at work and play into politics has sometimes seemed a tougher task. At one time, for example, the politics was based solely on race. In other words, one group will vote for one party, one ethnic group will vote for another party. But on three occasions in this country, we have transcended that. And back of racial politics has also been broken. Today, Trinidad has moved beyond African or Indian governments embracing instead a rainbow coalition. We are indeed a, a partnership of five parties and that has brought in a diversity of interest, a diversity of ethnicities, a diversity of uh, philosophies. I do believe it has to do with that consensus building. Building consensus and running a nation is vital. But even more important is the sense that government today is truly representative. The opening up of the political system, the entry into the formal politics of many people who really had been marginalized. I think on the whole this is a, a hopeful development. I don't see politics through color, creed or race. I can speak with authority to state that the government now is of the people and more of the people than any other government before. And this government of the people is busy reaching out to the lands its people have come from. January 2012, and Prime Minister Bisesar makes a triumphant return to the land of her ancestors. We are privileged to welcome one of the most distinguished Pravasi Bhartiyas as our chief guest. <laughs> Madam Kamala Prashad Bisesar created history by becoming the first woman Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Fettered by Prime Ministers and Presidents, here in Jaipur, she represents not just Trinidadians, but all diaspora Indians, capturing their hopes, their dreams, and their bond with India. I do hope that the people in India will recognize that there were people who left India for greener pastures and was able to return. In the short time that I have been in India, I can already feel the warmth of its people. India offers an impressive example of excellent leadership in the management of diaspora relations. By embracing the diaspora and embodying the sense of international unity, the ways in which we can benefit and support one another as nations as communities and as individuals are infinite. We also need to bring in new technology, and that new technology is available in places like India. This is why in the last 10 years, India has transformed itself and have become one of the economic giants in, in, in the world. For Prime Minister Bisesar, this Indian transformation into an unstoppable economic juggernaut is a vital reason that draws her here. This is a land of great opportunity. 
this time I come as the CEO of my nation. And so it is different in that regard because I seek partnerships with India, collaboration and cooperation that could redound to the benefit of Trinidad and Tobago and certainly to the benefit of India. One of the things countries like ours suffer is the issue of capital for investment and the need for um, increased foreign direct investment. In Trinidad and Tobago, I think there are a lot of opportunities for India businesses to come here and, and invest. Our climate is absolutely right for it. If we are able to encourage Indian businessmen to set up companies and factories like that here in Trinidad, we may be able to, to enter into the Latin American market based on our geographical position. That, that is one of the things that I hope could come out in, in terms of our trade relationships. We have the agreements with a lot of the other countries in South America, Central America, uh, that Indian manufacturers, Indian businessmen, uh, could take advantage of, they could actually uh, set up in Trinidad and then use Trinidad as a gateway to these other markets. Besides serving as a launching pad for Indian goods to enter the huge Latin American market, trade between India and Trinidad can cement India's links with all Trinidadians. When I talk about the, the possibility and the benefits to creating strategic linkages between Trinidad and Tobago, and India. It is not that it is East Indian businessmen who will be doing business with India, but really it spans the gamut. Non-Indian trainees are quick to take advantage of India's excellence in age-old crafts to create exquisite products that are highly sought after. I just feel there's a sensuality, there's a color, there's a passion. And lucky, maybe it's just luck, but the people I've always met through the India connections have been fantastic. I was taken to many factories where the garments are made and the block printing on the fabrics and that was overwhelming. The immense talent they have in carving and the tools that they use, the art and the culture and the wealth that you have was mind-boggling. Two factories, they work with me and they produce my designs. I buy fabric from them. The jewelry we show tonight, I had my Indian jeweler make for me in India. India is very easy to work with. It's, 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 you know, you used to think China was it, but India is amazing. I mean, I'm a small example. We have the metals, glass, tiles. There's so many industries, IT. I know so many people who have so many links, and yet there's so much more potential. I think there could be many other aspects as well, too. I have a particular friend of mine, and she travels to India constantly, where she brings in furniture and beautiful hand-woven and made rugs and um, cushions and, 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 and drapery and that sort of thing. And that's another aspect that's completely different now to, to food or to, to wear or fashion. And she does very, very well and she's known for what she brings in from India. And it's very good quality stuff. House of Jaipur was a concept that I had 10 years back. Even though I'm Trinidadian, I appreciated what India had to offer. I've catered to a community that is not used to it and they now are beginning to appreciate it. Disha has succeeded in bringing Indian crafts to all of Trinidad, but the East Indian community here has always had access to India. We've always had local businesses who have been purchasing goods and services from India and making it available to the local market. But in more recent years, we have Indian fairs where Indian traders come. What is interesting is when you look at the consumer base, it is not just East Indian that you see shopping yet. You will also see Afro-Trinidadians. You will see um, what we call um, the more Caucasian um, and more affluent um, parts of our society. In the past, distance is often limited trade. But in today's hyper-connected world, India's just a click away. I do a lot of my buying online. You'd be surprised. I don't think it's difficult at all. There are trade fairs in India that you can visit. There's so many trade fairs and it's very easily accessible. And the Indian High Commission here makes it very accessible. And they get, share a wealth of information for you. So that's very easy. Two years ago, I was part of the setting, setting up establishment, along with the Indian High Commission of the India, Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce. And uh, that chamber is working uh, very hard in terms of facilitating uh, greater linkages between India and Trinidad and Tobago. Beyond simple trade, Trinis look forward to India playing a crucial role in stalking the Trinidadian economy. I've been to Bangalore where I see these huge um, IT parks and these huge you know, computer and chip companies. I'd like to see some more links in terms of technology. Information technology. I mean, as you know, India has moved ahead uh, tremendously in this field. And when we look at how to, where to get inputs from or influence or development, India is 
also very much in the forefront. I feel India will be the place in the world as a new economic giant. They have what it takes, natural resources, base products, capital, technology. We have to do business and join with them as partners. India has a lot to offer. You know, you have technical, you have food, you know, you could, you have pharmaceutical that would, you know, benefit the whole Caribbean. When the rest of the world was going down, India was going up. And um, because of the already established uh, links that we have, because of who our ancestors are, it makes it easy for uh, people from India to work with us. Trini entrepreneurs are bullish on India, their government even more so. And this excitement has only been fueled by increasing links with India, increasing visits by Trinidadians eager to see a country that has so indelibly contributed to their own. Well, my first visit was to tell you about seeing this red soil from the aircraft and tears coming to my eyes. I remember arriving in India, um, the kiss in the ground. I left India very, very hungry because I felt I did not see India. It was too vast. When you go to India, you can't imagine how vast it was. I felt very much at many times that I was at home in India. I was so happy there, I didn't want to leave. Our impression about India is what we see from, from those uh, Bollywood movies. And having come to India, it's easy to take her most famous export home, feeding the frenzy that is Trinidad's love affair with Bollywood. India's fantastic Bollywood, Dev does, Sushmita Sen, Ashwari Rai, oh my god, oh my god, it's too much. You know, you always wanted to be like Amita Bachchan. Bollywood is, is, is big in Trinidad and Tobago, it's really big. And Bollywood's influence is best symbolized in one very special song. Welcome, this is Big Witch on Win Radio 101, your fusion music master. So I got a remix for you, yes, of the great, ever so popular Sohani Rat. Sohani Rat dhal chuki Na jane tum kab aoge Sohani Rat, beautiful night. Everybody play the song. Everybody listen to it. So honey rap, it's the anthem. So honey rap, that, that is our, our all time favorite. Musicians like Ravi B and Big Rich aren't content to simply listen to Bollywood songs or perform them. Instead, they're busy putting a Trini spin on B Town's best. Well, we use your melodies and write on that. Like, um, you're a beautiful woman, so I will um, use Sohani Rat <laughs> and write some English words about you. Bollywood has uh, influenced music a lot, but it has also led to the de development of a very uh, specific rhythm uh, from the Caribbean. Um, and that rhythm has become known as chutney and soca chutney. In this song, you'll hear a bit of, of soca music. And what, what, I, what I also put in the song is um, tassa. I, I think you're familiar with it. So that is giving you a real chutney feel there. Girl, I hope that you listen to wine like that. Girl, I hope that you listen to wine like that. In music and film, business and government, indeed in every aspect of life, Trinidadian Indians aren't just contributing, but surpassing, flying high the Trinidadian flag, doing proud their adopted homeland, while still making space for the land of their ancestors. The Indian contribution has been in the field of shaping the identity of the Caribbean region. Caribbean culture is actually in awe of the Indian culture now. I think the Caribbean culture has adopted it and embraced it completely. Indians continued making strides in terms of education, in terms of business and economic activity. It's an amazing journey from indentorship to being prominent people in, in the country and, and helping to build this country for what it is. The Indians have come to Trinidad so many years ago. They have lived in Trinidad, they have contributed to the development of Trinidad. They are as much Trinidadians as I am. 
you could be an Indian, you could be an African, you could be a Chinese, and you can still coalesce around a common vision for your country. We in Trinidad has front row seats to the cultures of the world because they're all ours. The story of migrants and migration is the story of the world. India is still migrating its population. If you've lost some of your children, their discovery is always an exciting one.